Mr. Joseph Pierce is one of the foremost Catholic biographers, writers and essayists of our time. He is formerly the writer-in-residence and professor of literature at Ave Maria University in Florida, where he worked for 12 years. He is an accomplished tutor, teacher and public speaker, originally from this side of the pond, from London, England. And he has written many books, uh, too many to mention in, in this time, but uh, prominently works of, on uh, G.K. Chesterton, on uh, C.S. Lewis, Hilaire Belloc, J.R.R. Tolkien, William Shakespeare, and Alexander Shol Solzhenitsyn. So, except for that last writer, you'll have noticed that there is a particular English uh, theme running through De Pierce's works. And recently I had the great pleasure of listening to uh, an EWTN broadcast where Mr. Pierce took a walk through the uh, village and the shrine of Walsingham discussing England's Catholic heritage. And it is a great pleasure to welcome Mr. Pierce today to explore a little bit more the history of England and its relationship to our Catholic faith. Mr. Pierce, welcome to Vendée Radio. It's my pleasure to be with you. Well, it's a, it's a great honour to, to have you here, Mr. Pierce, and um, I, I think I'll just begin with a quotation which you yourself wrote, which can frame this interview, and you, you said that what England truly is, is more than a thousand years of uninterrupted Christian faith from St. Alban, the first English martyr killed during the Roman occupation in the third century to the martyrdom of Saints John Fisher and Thomas More in 1535. She is the hundreds of martyrs killed during the penal times following Henry VIII's usurpation of the church in England. She is Beowulf and the dream of the rood. She is Sir Gawain and Chaucer. She is Bird and Talis. She is Walsingham and Glastonbury, she is Austin and Dickens, Newman and Hopkins, Chesterton and Belloc, Warren and Woodhouse, Lewis and Tolkien. She is Shakespeare. This is the England of our dreams, and our dreams are so much more real in any meaningful sense than the nightmare that the modern inhabitants of England seem to prefer. This is the England to which I owe my allegiance, the England of the saints and martyrs, the England of the poets and bards, and the England of the greatest bard of all. So it's... Uh, beautiful prose there and um, perhaps we could begin by you, you uh, providing a little bit of a, an explanation of the the origins of the of the Catholic faith in England. Yes and, and, and since I wrote those uh, lines I've been blessed to receive a contract to write a book on the history of, of true England, as I call it, um, in other words, history of Catholic England, from the first to the 21st century. And, and the tentative title for that is Faith of Our Fathers, A History of True England. Uh, and um, it will be published uh, early in 2022. Now we, we greatly look forward to that. And, and I hope that this interview can provide a little bit of a, uh, a musée bouche for uh, that work. Uh, to come. And so, uh, although many of our listeners will be familiar with the uh, Apostle of the English, St. Augustine of Canterbury, arriving in Thanet in Kent in 597, uh, this wasn't the beginning of, uh, of Christianity in, in this island, these isles, the British Isles, we, where in fact we, we have much evidence of a thriving Christian community in uh, Roman times. Could you, you say something a little bit about that? Yes, indeed. And in, 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 my, in my, my, my book that I've written, there are two chapters that precede, at least two chapters that precede the arrival of St. Augustine of Canterbury. Uh, one is called A Christ-Haunted Country, and the other is called The England Before England. Now, A Christ-Haunted Country refers to the legends surrounding uh, St. Joseph of Arimathea, perhaps the best, um, the best encapsulation of that, of course, are the words of you know, um, William Blake's poem Jerusalem, which is in some sense the unofficial English national anthem, at least if you're a rugby fan, um, you know, that uh, and did those feet in ancient times walk upon England's mountains green and was the holy lamb of God in England's pleasant uh, pastures sea. That, uh, that refers to a, 
a pious legend, which may indeed just be wishful thinking, that uh, there are two pious legends surrounding St. Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, one is uh, that he came with the Christ child himself, so thus and did those feet in ancient times, walk upon England's mountains green. Um, but also the, that he came later, uh, in, a, in, a, in, short, short, in, the, in the 60s AD, so only 30 or so years after the crucifixion, and brought with him uh, the Holy Grail. And so, of course, the whole Arthurian dimension of English legend uh, has its roots in these uh, pious legends from the roots of, of Christianity. So that's the Christ-haunted aspect. But as regards to England before England, we do know that by the 3rd century AD, um, the shrine to Our Lady and the chapel to Our Lady in Glastonbury was already considered ancient. So the, 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 the genuine, generally uh, accepted historic date for the arrival of, uh, of the first missionaries to England, uh, only about 15 years after the arrival of the Romans, so in the 60s uh, AD, appears to be absolutely believable, whether or not Sir Joseph Van Mathia was amongst them. The point is that the first Christians, we would expect them to be coming in, if you like, on the shirt tails of, of the Roman conquerors, because that's the way that Christianity was spreading throughout the empire. So it arrived in England in the 60s AD, um, and by the time that um, Augustine arrives, more than 500 years later, Christianity had been in, in the land which is now called England, um, uh, for you know, half a millennium. Yes, and I, I understand that one of the, the treasures from this period is uh, from the Walter Newton hoard that was discovered in the 70s near, near Cambridge, including possibly the oldest chalice in existence. I, I don't know the details of that, but did that, have, they, have they made an effort to date it? I, I think it's kind of indistinguishable, possibly third century, similar to the Hinton St. Mary mosaic. It's, but it, it just goes to show that these, these treasures of our, of our Christian past are still being uh, uncovered and there are some you know, tremendously important artifacts being found. It is quite clear from reading Bede that there's a, a formidable widespread Christian presence in England before the Saxons arrive, and then and and there's that that's part of the 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 the, the conflict that the sin of the Whitby resolves, you know, because there are two churches going on, if you like. There's the there's the older, from an English perspective, uh, the older Celtic church, uh, and then there's the Roman church that comes in with Canterbury, uh, with so sort of Augustine of Canterbury, and uh, you know, so they, they, they have this sort of uh, mess, if you like, this this uh, murkiness about certain things such as the date of Easter that need to be resolved, and it's the sin of Whitby when the church is once more united under Rome, um, uh, much to St. Bede's delight. Yes, and I, I'm sure that you would be able to, uh, that you've notice that the, the, the Holy Thorn of Glastonbury, as part of the legend of St. Joseph of Arimathea, that Wearywell Hill, he planted his staff and the next day a, 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 a thorn had uh, sprouted. And this thorn to this day, I believe, sprouts twice a year at, around Christmas and Easter. And the sprig is sent to Her Majesty the Queen. Yes, and I do. I do mention that in my book, uh, that the actual original thorn uh, was destroyed uh, in the time of Henry VIII, or uprooted, but, but, um, but um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm not a botanist. Uh, then they took, the parts of it were taken off and replanted, uh, which is typical of what the English did at the time. They did everything possible to preserve their Catholic heritage, whether it's the relics of the saints or the great Catholic works of art, or indeed, in this case, uh, the Glastonbury thorn, these holy relics, uh, from the destruction of, of, of Henry VIII and his successors. Um, and this is an example of basic, and, and so it, it, the continuum, possibly from St. Joseph of Arimathea, if we, if we want to allow ourselves to be pious in our belief um, and not overly sceptical. But either way, a mirac certainly a miraculous thorn that, 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 um, that flowers at that, those significant dates every year. And I, certainly the, uh, Her Majesty the Queen is quite happy to... Uh, to uh, to receive it and uh, and thanks be to God. Uh, and J.R.R. Tolkien must have taken inspiration from the Holy Thorn regarding uh, the White Tree of Gondor. Extremely likely. I mean, we know that that uh, that 
that Tolkien was uh, steeped in Anglo-Saxondom, but also in pre-Anglo-Saxondom. He had a great love for the Welsh language, which has basically have been the indigenous language of, of, the, of, of England prior to the Romans uh, and even during the Romans up to a point. Um, so he has great love of the Welsh language, great love of Old English, uh, and is steeped in the history and culture of those times. And, and without, without those roots, including the glass of Thorn, uh, we would not have his legendarium. And so it's a, 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 yet another reason for us to be grateful for this England before England. Yes, that's, that's beautiful. And so you, you mentioned about the Synod of Whitby and the evangelization of England, the, the baptism of the English nations, because we're talking multiple uh, Saxon kingdoms at this time. Um, it, it, could you say a little bit about this process that, that St. Bede chronicles? Because in many ways it's, it's not as, um, it's quite a, quite a quick evangelization compared to some countries. Well, relatively, I mean, the English quite clearly were uh, much more open to the gospel they, than, say, for instance, the Germanic peoples that mm. took longer. Um, that um, Bede, of course, is only, because of the time Bede's writing, he's only recording the first half of the 500, under 500 years of Anglo-Saxondom. Um, and so taken as a whole, you know, I, 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 can't, I can't remember exactly what the two chapter titles are, uh, that, that, well, I think the first is the England before England, and then the other is a land of saints. And then the final chapter that covers this, this is the book I, I mentioned I have written. Uh, the final chapter is something, uh, a holy uh, holy king and, uh, 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 it's about a king and a queen being, of course, that the that Anglo-Saxon goes out like a supernova with great beauty uh, and light because we have a saint on the throne and we have the apparition of the Blessed Virgin of Walsingham. Um, so uh, the 1060s, just before the Norman Conquest, uh, is, a, is, a, is, is the culmination of this half millennium of, um, of uh, um, Catholic presence in England. In the, you know, and it, it was a land of saints. And you just, it, if you just go through the litany of Anglo-Saxon saints, uh, it, it's just, it's a glorious age for the church in England and anything but a dark age. Yes, absolutely. And, and deeply conversant with the rest of Christendom and with Rome. You know, you consider King Alfred the Great's correspondence with the Pope and the, yes, the familiarity of English bishops, and then you know later uh, Bishop Anselm from Italy. It was a, it was very much a um, a united Christian part of Christendom, and very much a cultured one. I mean, uh, so King Alfred the Great uh, translated Boethius, you know, from Latin into English. Um, they, this this was a very culturally conversant. Uh, um, nation at the time that in many ways a golden age and and we really do need to look at anglo-saxon England as a golden age uh and um we really, we need to restore and re-establish uh our um our knowledge of it and our communion with it and especially those of us that are english i would say that this is this is a, a part of the common heritage of all of christendom but, but certainly for, for, for native-born Englishmen, this is very much a part of, of who we are and our heritage and our roots. And um, uh, it's, it's criminal and negligent for us to, to be ignorant of it. Indeed. And one of those great saints, not himself uh, Anglo-Saxon, but a, a Greek from, from Tarsus, uh, St. Theodore of Tarsus. You mentioned the Synod of Whitby, 1665. St. Theodore of Tarsus convened the, Synod, the Council of, of Hartford, where he summoned the bishops of all the seven English kingdoms, East Anglia, Essex, Kent, Mercia, etc., and established common canons and church disciplines, particularly in the liturgy, despite the fact that these kingdoms would often feud and, and war with each other. But the, the important point here is that England was an ecclesial realm before it was a political realm. Uh, so its spiritual right. identity predates its political existence. England existed in the heart and mind before it took flesh, and then it, there was a procession from the spiritual to the material that is analogous to the Annunciation. Okay. Yes, indeed, and very well expressed. Uh, the, the, the key thing here, in a healthy po uh, politics, 
uh, the church is a powerful presence which, which transcends the secular power. And that's necessary because the secular power is almost invariably self-serving, which means that those in power are really only interested in uh, increasing their power, and that is, is in, inevitably at the, at, the, at the cost to the poor. So having, having a, a powerful ecclesial presence in any political culture that transcends the power of the secular culture is actually a way that, of preserving the dignity of the human person at grassroots level. And it's the absence of that of which, not solely Henry VIII, I mean, other countries similar things happened, but uh, that Henry VIII is responsible ultimately for leaving uh, the ordinary human persons, uh, Englishmen, at the at, at the mercy of those who have power and the will to use that power for their own self-serving ends and that's been the history of politics in england for the last 500 years yes england suffered it, its central trauma in its history the protestant revolution the, the defamation uh, and the almost the first of the great revolutions as you say the will of a determined minority against a confused majority and but but just to go back to to um, the apparition of Our Lady of Walsingham to the Lady Rochelle, this she was uh, instructed to build a replica of the the Holy House of Nazareth, and this really began a, a great flowering of Marian devotion in medieval England. I, I think England was actually one of the the most Marian nations in Christendom. Um, <laughs> Yes, and, and, and indeed, you know, of the major shrines of the, of the Middle Ages, um, you know, so if you might call them, you know, the High Middle Ages, and, and the, the flowering of the church and Christendom, they made the major shrines of the obvious ones, like Jerusalem and Rome and Santiago de Compostela, but beyond that, two, the two major shrines of the whole of Christendom are both in England. Um, uh, first of all, Canterbury, um, with, with the, because of St. Thomas Beckett, uh, but also uh, Walsingham because of the Blessed Virgin and the apparition there in 1061. And there were pilgrimage routes from Europe. Uh, and you know, the, the most common would probably have been from Norwich to Walsingham, um, probably from Yarmouth to Norwich to Walsingham, uh, although they probably sailed up to Norwich before starting to walk. Um, uh, and because Norwich was the second largest city in England uh, during the Middle Ages, and you know, the, the, the often given purely materialistic economic reasons for that, such as the textile industry and, and, and the, the, the easy access of Norwich to, to, uh, to, to um, Flanders, etc., and, and so the textile industry. And I'm sure all that's true. But at a time of great faith, if the major Marian shrine of the whole of Christendom uh, is uh, is in Walsingham, and the, the the easiest, most accessible way of getting there from anywhere except London <laughs> and, and and other parts of England, but from the continent is via Norwich, it's quite clearly going to be a major centre and very cosmopolitan. The people arriving from different parts of of Europe to go on pilgrimage to the shrine of Our Lady. So, you know, England in the Middle Ages was 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 a, a gem. In, in, in the crown of Christendom, and certainly not somewhere on, on the hinterland edges. It was actually, spiritually speaking, at the centre of things. Yes, and there's evidence that English Marian devotion being, being so strong and that uh, devotions, veneration of the Immaculate Conception, for example, originated first being recorded, even in Anglo-Saxon times, d devotion to St. Anne, the earliest office of the daily little office to Our, Our Lady, the origins of the widely popular Mar Marian miracle collections. So, you know, the, uh, incredibly strong Marian devotion and a, a tradition arising of, of England being Our Lady's dowry. Yes, and, I, and that's also the, 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 uh, the title of one of the chapters of my book, Our Lady's Dowry, uh, con uh, concerning the Middle Ages. Uh, I, in addition to what you've said there, all of which is, is, is abundantly true, just look at the number of Saxon and Norman churches around the country that are devoted to St. Mary. All right? I mean, I, I, have, I don't know what the figures are, but the, the actual proportion of Anglo-Saxon uh, Anglo Norman churches dedicated to the Virgin 
uh, is extraordinarily high. And I would guess if someone were to do the research, higher than would be the case uh, of churches dedicated around the rest of Christendom, which would be an empirical way of proving what you've just said. Uh, and, and as regards the Immaculate Conception, where we, should be, we, we need to remember that it was Duns Scotus who was the great champion of that, of what became a dogma um, uh, in, in the Middle Ages. And although he's a Scotsman, as his name would suggest, he was obviously at Oxford uh, and uh, is part of, uh, of this Anglo-Saxondom, if you like, that um, this, this, this Our Lady's dowry. And it's not, no, should not surprise us that someone who's from these islands should have been the great champion of the doctrine, the doctrine and dogma of the Immaculate Conception in the Middle Ages being ahead of his time as regards the rest of Christendom needing to catch up. And talking of Oxford, I, I believe four of the original colleges were dedicated to Our Lady, as was the School of Eton when it was founded by Henry VI. So England was so Catholic. And just moving on to other foundational institutions of, of the English nation, the famous uh, counter-revolutionary author, Joseph de Maist, wrote that the English constitution was the most complex unity and the most propitious equilibrium of political powers that the world has ever seen. As it, and it was guided in their course by an infallible power. End quote. There, there is a deep admiration for this Aristotelian hybrid of democracy, monarchy and uh, aristocracy. Um, and then we, we, we can see that the, the triumphs, the, the, the great achievements of, of the English nation, crown, parliament and common law, you know, the, the church, were, were all fontal institutions from uh, the Catholic faith. Of which the church herself was very much involved with her prelates being uh, at the forefront of the negotiations, for instance, uh, with uh, King John at the time of Magna Carta. Um, so all of this was established at the behest of the church. And there's actually a recently published book that I've discussed over here on a, on a weekly book club that I do uh, uh, called America on Trial by Robert Wiley. Uh, and he is also very much uh, shows historically how the roots of all that's good in the American Constitution are to be found in Magna Carta and in the and in the English Constitution as established by the Church. And Robert Wiley's a Catholic and he makes no bones about the fact that it was only because of the Church's ability to bring the secular ruler uh, to order that Magna Carta happened and that the foundation of English common law and, and by extension uh, the American Constitution became possible. Yes, it's very interesting. And there's, there's the great revolutionary Rousseauian myth of the, the social contract. But the, the historian Patrick Wormald uh, talks about the origins of, of common law as originating, arising from a social covenant. And the, the, the doom book of Alfred the Great, uh, whereby law expressed royal fidelitas in return for that of the people. It, law was something promised and reciprocity was integral to that ancient English understanding of law. Yeah, and it also has at its heart something which we've lost uh, due to the Enlightenment, that, that political order and social justice are rooted in the necessity of responsibility. Um, to, to, to remove responsibility from the equation and replace it with, with rights makes the whole thing, first of all, con con contractual, but also self-centered. It's all about, it's all about um, contesting political powers within the order, fighting for their own supremacy and their, uh, and their, and their, and their own pecking order. It becomes basically uh, self-serving power, which means those with the power keep it. Uh, that's just the, the centralization of power into fewer and fewer hands is, is an inevitable consequence of, of uh, talking about rights as opposed to responsibilities. Yes, that's what my friend uh, Dr. Miguel Ayuso calls kratologia, the logic of power, where this ideology is imposed to cloak and advance the interests of the powerful, the, the powerful private interests. And when you remove uh, objectivity, when you remove truth from the equation, um, what, what do you have left? You only have power. Right? There's no truth yeah. to serve, you serve yourself. 
right? And your own interests. Yes, truth is the opinion of the powerful, as uh, I think Thrasymachus said. But just to demonstrate, you know, how much the Catholic faith informed the great achievements of English history, and the fact we want we aren't talking here so about church and state. That's a, a historical distinction, as it were, in hindsight. We're talking about the spiritual power, the temporal power. But every but everyone was baptized. You had clergy and laity. Everyone, everything was washed in the blood of the Lamb. Uh, so Alfred's doom book was was planned as an epitome of God's covenant with the people to whom he had given lowland Britain. And the homilies of Archbishop Wolfstan were bound in with the same codices so that law could be viewed. So law was viewed and then inserted into liturgical book, books. So the religious you know, matter was not uh, uh, accidental or extraneous. It was deeply harmonized and integrated yeah i mean basically the whole understanding that the temporal power which is always going to be tempted towards uh self-interest um is transcended by and ultimately superseded by the spiritual power actually keeps the political power in order in other words from being disordered uh and and, and that's the whole purpose of having a culture which sees the necessity of the spiritual claims of the church taking precedence over the self-interest of whoever happens to have power at the time. And so we, we move on to the, the well, we, we haven't done justice, obviously, to the, the great period of the Middle Ages and, and, and Merry England. But I, I did want to ask about the great rupture of the Heinrichian Revolution. Uh, the great trauma, the great wound, and uh, the the Tudor period. If there are any sort of comments that you'd like to express there. Well, yeah. Again, one of the challenges in in writing my my book was how does one cover the uh, 150 year period of intense persecution during which priests and laity were were condemned to death for their faith, and the 300 years of broader persecution when, when, when Catholics were denied uh, the, 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 the same uh, uh, civil rights as, as, the, as the rest of the population. How do you, how do you cover that, that period uh, in a sense that is, dovetails and is in harmony with the whole, the whole 2000 year story? You know, do you allow the 300 years to sort of protrude? <laughs> Um, and, and, and it was it was very difficult for me, but I did actually allow that to happen because I do think that we do not understand um, the fullness of what true England is if we do not understand the fullness of the sacrifice that true England made over those three centuries. And so, you know, probably uh, something like a, a third of the book uh, covers is covered by the covers those three centuries alone um, because I just thought it was necessary to actually um, to look at this in detail to look at the role of the martyrs to look at the role of secular power to see that the the how the bitter fruits of the world in which we now find ourselves were laid uh, during the 16th century and so uh, I, I'm guessing I, I, I not found there's something like nine chapters covering the period from uh, Henry VIII's rupture uh, with the church. I love, by the way, you mentioned the word deformation. I presume you meant uh, deformation as in deformation, but I like to play, play on words. It's both deformation and defamation because it's defaming, it's built on lies and, and defaming uh, the uh, the mystical body of Christ. Um, but um, so but from the time of Henry VIII in the 1530s, uh, through to um, uh, the aftermath of the so-called Glorious Revolution in the 1680s, probably there's probably about seven or eight chapters covering that period, because anybody that wants to understand through England in her entirety and integrity has to understand the centrality of, 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 those, uh, of that period. Yes, quite. And obviously you've written very, very widely and eloquently on um, Elizabethan and Jacobean drama, could you say something about how this again was a, f a fruit of Catholic culture? 
Yeah, the important thing we have to understand, you know, is that we don't understand Shakespeare unless we understand both who Shakespeare is, not even was, because <laughs> you know who he is 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 is, is a fact. Um, that unless we understand who Shakespeare is and the the culture in which he lived. Uh, and that's another reason I spent so much time on those chapters in my book. And when you realize that, certainly at the time that Shakespeare begins to write, in the so late 1580s, early 1590s, the majority of English people are still Catholic uh, in sympathy and sensibility. And there's a significant number who are defying the laws of the land. By the time he dies in 1616, the... the, the um, uh, the, 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 the whole uh, political and religious structure of England had, had swung ultimately, well not ultimately because the world story is not over, uh, had, had swung um, uh, in, 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 uh, away from the church. So Shakespeare is writing during a period when the church uh, is under attack and where the powers of secularism are on the ascendant. And you see that in his works, especially in the great tragedies such as Hamlet and, and King Lear and Macbeth, and Othello, where the, the, the battle is always between conventional Catholic uh, morality and uh, secular Machiavellianism. That is the, that's the recurring theme in Shakespeare's work, and that's exactly what you would expect a Catholic writing in the 1590s and 1600s to be, to, to be uh, uh, fixated upon, to, to be preoccupied with. And how important was his witnessing, his probable witnessing of um, basically medieval mystery plays in Coventry to the formation of his dramatic uh, imagination and vision? Well, I think two things there. It's almost certainly he, that he went to Coventry because it was probably the largest of, 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 the, uh, of, the, of the mystery cycles being performed every year. Uh, he, we know for an absolute fact, I mean, it's not even disputed that Shakespeare was raised in a, in a defiantly and recusant Catholic home. Um, and uh, the, the, the mystery plays were not actually um, uh, suppressed until uh, uh, the 15... Um, 80s. So Shakespeare, as a as a boy and as a, a young teenager, would almost certainly have gone annually to to witness and enjoy that that dramatic uh, manifestation of Catholicism. And it's uh, inconceivable that that was not um, uh, a significant influence upon uh, first of all his his initiation into Christian drama, but also his passion for reproducing that as far as the laws of the land allowed uh, uh, ten, or, 10 or so years later. Thank you. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Christopher Dawson's opinion that although England suffered this tremendous trauma, you have this strange uh, state religion of Anglicanism, which retains and adopts many uh, Catholic trappings, although emptied of, of the true life uh, within. And he says that England was fortunate, was blessed to not suffer a great political revolution, almost to this day, in a sense, uh, certainly, you know, to avoid the tumult of the, the continent and the the Enlightenment and then the, the, the revolutionary upheavals. And, and there are several continental observers who, who came to England in the 18th and 19th century and admired that the forces of irreligion and disorder had not gained uh, as large a traction here. And Dawson writes very strongly about the 18th century Georgian England as being a, a squirearchy, essentially an organic culture that remained agrarian, that, that remained traditional, uh, why do, you, why do you think that is? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm pleased that we're going to have uh, the opportunity for a, a, a bit of disagreement here um, because that makes conversation a little bit more interesting. Because it, you know, Dawson's approach differs from Belloc's, uh, it differs from, from uh, Lingard, and it differs from Cobbett, of course, who basically grew from Lingard. Um, that basically by the 18th century, England was a plutocracy, uh, not a squirearchy, which sounds very nice, quaint name that the Americans you know, 
Jane Austen, etc. Um, that basically that the the, the 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 new aristocracy that that had gained power and wealth through the plundering of the church uh, in the 16th century were now ruling the roost. Uh, one of the reasons it took so long for the Catholic Church to uh, uh, and Catholics in England to to re re regain their their rights was because this um, uh, this new plutocracy was very much at enmity with the church, and for good reason, because uh, they were squatting on church property. And the only way they could justify that is by being very antagonistic towards the idea of the church. So um, I, I would argue, actually, that the, the reason that England led the way in the rise of secularism and relativism was that the state religion was treated with such scorn and contempt by the majority of the people that when they were browbeaten out of their faith, out of their Catholicism, they just became cynical and skeptical. Um, and so it laid the foundations, and that's why England was certainly ahead in things such as the Industrial Revolution uh, and, and, and much of the philosophy, England and Scotland, of, of, of the Enlightenment. Um, but there's an irony here, because uh, at the time of the French Revolution, uh, the English plutocracy was so uh, horrified at what was happening to their um, uh, um, their counterparts in France that um, that they were very antagonistic towards the French Revolution and therefore very um, open to accepting uh, the arrival of refugees from the revolution into England. And one consequence of that were tens of thousands of Catholics coming to the country, including hundreds and hundreds of priests. Uh, and you know, almost overnight, you know, the Catholic presence in England, you know, uh, uh, grew manifold as a direct consequence of the French Revolution. You know, and God, you know, writes straight with crooked lines. You know, that basically you could say that some of the seeds of the Catholic uh, uh, restoration and revival in England were actually sowed as a byproduct of the guillotine. Yes, that's yeah, subject for much pondering. I agree with, with everything you say, Mr. Pierce, and I would say that, that Dawson uh, certainly acknowledges the, the, the fundamental power structure of the oligarchy who manufacture or support a, a crowned republic with, the, with these, these trappings that survive. And, and through enclosure and very, very many other in unjust uh, actions actually very much mistreat the populace, the people, very, very much so. Uh, and, and I think he's in agreement with Belloc there. I've, the, the point is that there's a tension in the 18th century. You know, there is a Toryism which is free of the kind of... Yes, there is the, the English, the Scottish Enlightenment, the empiricism and so on. But outside the kind of ivory tower, the you know, rarefied circles, the decadence, the aristocracy, organic rural life does continue, although it is you know, very, very much uh, attacked and disrupted by these, these trends. And, but a point he makes is that if you look at the, that oligarchy, it was different to the continental oligarchy in being fundamentally rural, which is evinced in the um, 18th century landscape portraits, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Gainsbury. You know, the aspirations are towards that and you know, the, the country pursuits and so on, whereas the continental elite are attracted to the salon and the an urban life and you know refinement and so on. So he, he sees that as kind of a kind of conservative manifestation. Well, there's no doubt at all that 18th century French aristocracy was was was, was, was extremely decadent and corrupt, uh, and that in itself laid the foundations for uh, for the revolution. But uh, you know, if you were to actually look at the culture uh, in the broadest sense of the word. And uh, of France and England, France would have been much more agrarian in terms of the way that the ordinary people lived than England. And, and that was largely because the English peasantry had been forced off of their land by the enclosures, by the, the, the absence of the church to protect their interests. Um, and they forced into the new mill towns and working in factories and, and, and the burgeoning cities. I mean, Birmingham was a village in 1750. Um, so, so you have this new urbanized, industrialized England 
which actually was very much uh, at variance with the still largely agrarian culture and economy of France, where there was still a living peasantry, uh, where the peasants actually had land and therefore had a degree of power because they had land. So, um, what, and as usual, I mean, the, the French Revolution was exactly like the Bolshevik Revolution. It was an urban uh, manifestation that they that then forced itself upon the rural areas. So the Bolshevik Revolution is centered in Moscow and St. Petersburg, and then imposes itself upon the rest of the country. The French Revolution is centered upon Marseille and Paris, and imposes itself upon the rest of the country. And in the case of the Vendée, and obviously bearing in mind that the, 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 the entity that you are hosting here um, is, is very close to, to your own heart, in the case of the Vendée, Vendée through, a, through, a, through a process of what can really only be called genocide. Yes, exactly. The work of, of bourgeois groups and secret societies, especially. Yes, well, I think perhaps another time we could discuss the English Vendée, the, the Great Western Uprising and the Pilgrimage of Grace. But just to, to quote from Dawson regarding 18th century, he said, the heart of England was with the solid traditionalism of Dr. Johnson or the intense pietism of Cowper and the Wesleys. Uh, moreover, the coming of the House of Hanover, so far from introducing continental influences, served rather to weaken the prestige of the court and to make the country more obstinately English than ever. Neither our society nor our art served the court and the capital, both alike centred in the family, in the country houses or in the homes of the merchants. And this is true of both the chief manifestations of English art during this period, the great portrait painters and the, great, and the late Georgian school of architecture, and decoration of which the typical representatives are the brothers Adam. Well, again, I I, I don't I don't uh, disapprove of that anywhere near as much as as as, as the earlier uh, panoramic analysis of uh, uh, of Dawson, um, but uh, I I I again I would I would caution when 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 in Chesterton in the Victorian age literature talks about the Victorian compromise. Uh, and it, all sorts of things happen in England simultaneously, and I think it's a bit simplistic to talk about one, uh, one side, such as these, the conservative squirearchy, as opposed to all the, 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 the new ideas. Yeah, you, have, you do have a, a bona fide religious revival in the Anglican Church, which becomes nonconformism, um, and then, of course, later you, do, you have the, 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 the Oxford movement uh, of Anglo-Catholicism, uh, but you also have the rise of materialism, the Darwinian understanding of, uh, of uh, human evolution uh, and its political ramifications, scepticism, scientism, uh, but also the revival of Catholicism. It's all happening. And, you know, the, 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 the Victorian period, which is really, if you like, the, the, the spilling over of, of what's happening in the, in the 18th century, uh, shows that that that... that England was in a cauldron at this at this time, but what emerges from it, from our perspective as Catholics, is that the the Catholic Church was effectively, by the beginning of the 19th century, certainly prior to the French Revolution, extinguished, except for a thin, true line, shall we say, of of reticence, and even some of those were beginning to become worldly. Um, so you could have you could have if you were a realist in 1800. Um, you would have uh, predicted the effective that the Catholic Church was finished and dead. And of course, there may be a few sort of irrelevant, powerless remnants, but, but who cares? Uh, and yet, by the death of Newman in 1890, we have a restored hierarchy and that number of Catholic churches and schools spring up all over the country. You know, partly because of conversions, partly because of Irish immigration, partly because of the French Revolution. But in other words, the providence provides. And uh, that's why True England is still here after 2,000 years, uh, in spite of the various efforts at various times to destroy it. Yes, yeah, so you see in the 18th and 19th century that Anglicanism, particularly high Anglicanism, is, is haunted by the, the, the memory of the Catholic faith and trying to square this circle as uh, identifying Anglicanism as a form of apostolic Christianity, which is not and then that, that leading to the Oxford movement and this, this Catholic breath of the 19th century, which doesn't, doesn't win England back, doesn't convert England, but does a great yield of uh, apostolic fruit. I, I, don't, I heard recently that because you had two, I don't want to say factions, but let's say groups in the, the, amongst English Catholics in the 19th century, you could say 
the more ultramontane group re represented by, let's say, Father Faber and, uh, you know, expressed in the Brompton Oratory, very kind of Baroque and, and Roman, and then, and then a more, let, let's say, sort of Anglo-focused group, of, of, for example, Cardinal Newman, and they, the, I believe, I don't, please correct me, it's uh, Pope Gregory the Sixteenth actually offered use of the serum rite to the re-established hierarchy in England, and the the ultramontane faction won out and established the Tridentine rite. But but some people say this was a tremendous missed opportunity because in Catholicism since has been identified as, as T. S. Eliot pointed out, you know, as as a kind of essentially foreign force and that it's the the religion of you know irish uh, navvies and italian waiters whereas that was a chance to really link to to reconnect the the serum right the me medieval christianity english christianity with the, the catholic faith in this country in the 19th century onwards well the first thing i would say to that and most of it i agree with no problem but i've got to just pick 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 bones please, um, please. <laughs> T.S. Eliot, you know, it was Jacques Maritain that said of T.S. Eliot, um, when, when someone asked Jacques Maritain, why did T.S. Eliot never become a Catholic in the full sense of the word? And Jacques Maritain laughed and said that T.S. Eliot had exhausted all of his powers of conversion when he became an Englishman. Um, and I think that's very important because for Eliot, you know, uh, basically New England arist aristocracy born in St. Louis, Missouri, wanted so badly to be English that he really embraced a caricatured, you know, what would say over here, PBS, you know, a public broadcasting service, you know, that we, you know, a caricatured England, uh, which is idyllic, uh, but not incarnate or real. So I, I, would, I would take with a huge pinch of salt anything T.S. Eliot says about the Catholic Church, quite frankly, I think he's bought into uh, a certain type of prejudice to prove that he's more English than the English. Um, so that's the first thing I'll say. I would say that the 19th century was characterized by, by neo-medievalism in various manifestations, and that was a healthy reaction against the Enlightenment and against the Reformation. So what I sometimes say that what happens here is leapfrog, is that they just wanted to sort of leapfrog over the nightmare immediate past and find a purer, uh, more distant past. And so you find neo-medieval this manifestation, such as the Gothic revival, Augustus Pugin, a convert, uh, the pre-Raphaelite brotherhood in the arts, and of course the Oxford movement. So if you like, the, the Catholic reaction in the 19th century, which brought so many beautiful fruits, um, uh, was, a, was a healthy reaction against, against both the Reformation and the Enlightenment. And, and that is what brought, brought forth poured forth the Catholic revival. And you are, of course, correct that um, England has not converted to Catholicism. That's, that's true. But, um, but if you look at the contribution that Catholicism has made to English culture, and specifically English language culture, in other words, the extent to which that's global now, mm -hmm. uh, in the great works of literature that have been produced uh, as a consequence of, of, of that revival, we actually see that, 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 that Catholicism has become central in the English-speaking world as regards high art, as some of the, some of the great works, of what, what, what will be maybe 300 years from now, from now canonical, if people can still read, um, you know, are, 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 are a consequence of this neo-medievalism and this reaction against the, the uh, Protestant Reformation and the Enlightenment. Yes, it's... Um... There's so much I'd like to discuss. I'm, I'm conscious of, of time and I, I'd like to, to ask you some questions related to that. And, and one of those is, uh, what, what is a Catholic perspective on the British Empire? Because um, it's, it's funny, you know, you t when, you, when one sort of goes abroad, the British Empire is such a part of how foreigners view Britain. And yet Britons are pretty unaware of, of that heritage in a large way because of our Marxist education system, basically. But the, I mean, on the one hand, it was it was Masonic, it was ruthlessly commercial, it did great harm to, let, you know, for example, the great Spanish Empire, the Catholic Spanish Empire, the Catholic nations really attacking any kind of uh, counter-revolutionary movement in South America or, you know, or in Europe, like the Carlists, for example. But on the other hand, Leo XIII wrote that, in his letter to the English people, that 
quote, everyone knows the power and resources of the British nation and the civilizing influences which, with the spread of liberty, accompanies its commercial prosperity even to the most remote regions. And you have the space that was created, the, the, the channel by which, for example, Irish missionaries could disseminate the, the, the true gospel. And, and somewhere like Australia, by the middle of the 20th century, was a third Catholic basically because of the British Empire. So what, what is the right sort of perspective? Yeah, well, there, there is, um, uh, that's a very convoluted, complicated, um, multifaceted uh, subject, and it would take probably a whole hour in itself. I'm, I'm going to begin, however, with, I, with what I consider to be fundamentals, and, and, and fundamentals in terms of who we are. First of all, there is, uh, I think, a, a, a crucial distinction between English and British, um, especially as the word British does not necessarily just mean Scottish, uh, Welsh and Irish, but also Indian and Jamaican and Australian and Canadian and, and the rest of it. So uh, I'm going to answer, first of all, uh, in, in the fact that I am a convert, not merely from effectively anti-Catholic agnosticism to Catholicism, but also from being a great Britisher to being a little Englander. And I wrote a very short poem, which I'm going to give you because it's the, but the best way I can actually answer your question succinctly. Uh, it does, it's not a full answer, but it's the, I think it's the beginning of the answer. So what I wrote is just called Sunset. When the sunset, sorry, when Britain had an empire, the sun would never set. But the sunset over England and Englishmen forget that greater than the empire are the rolling Yorkshire moors and more glorious the dales than all the empire's wars. So really, I suppose what I'm saying is to be English really is to be in, is to be in harmony with the landscape, the place, the, the theology of place, you know, Hill Everlock, Sussex, um, you know, that, that to me is the real England and to be happy with the smallness of the country um, uh, and, and not for its greatness, uh, not least because the greatness is often bound up with things such as pride in the theological sense, um, uh, as well as, you know, a manifestation such that's mercantilism, um, Freemasonry, as you mentioned, uh, and anti-Catholic interests. So uh, is, is it fair to demonize the British Empire? No, because it's too simplistic, right? I mean, that, that if you look at the, the, the Indian uh, subcontinent, the whole economic infrastructure was laid by the British Empire, that insofar as there's material wealth in India now, a large part of it is due to the British Empire. So clearly, you know, that it, it's a mixed bag. And, uh, and we should see it as such, but you know, I don't want to muddy the waters. And to me, uh, the history of New England is the history of England, uh, which is distinct from the history of Britain, uh, and specifically distinct from the British Empire, which is something which is a manifestation of, of the non-Catholic England. Thank you. That's a very precious poem there, uh, Mr. Pearson. I really appreciate that perspective. And I hope to do a future broadcast with Mr. Charles Coulomb, who I believe is a mutual friend, uh, yes, on a, a Catholic perspective on the British Empire. And I love you uh, reclaim the title of, of Little Englander. I love when, when revolutionaries throw insults at us. They like say, you know, you're a Little Englander or, or you're, a, you're a patriarchal. And we say, yeah, I am. Come yeah. at me. Yeah, I mean, to be a Little Englander is say that yeah, I'm happy to be small. I don't actually want to be a globalist. I don't want to be part of a global empire, whether it's the British Empire or whether it's the, 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 the neo-globalist empire of the 21st century. I just want a sovereign nation that's able to be politically free from the, the globalist multinational elites. Yes, well, a holy Roman Empire would be, would be okay. Um, right. Except it wasn't very holy, but that's another discussion. <laughs> okay, oh, that, 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 could be, that could be good. Okay, so I, I'd like to ask you a very um, a mystical question, a very deep question regarding the English soul, so, which we've touched on. And I don't know if you're familiar with the, the author, Dr. Plinio Correa de Oliveira, a Brazilian author. No, I don't think I am. Well, he, he wrote an essay on the, the different vocations of the, English, of the European nations. He, he talked about this notion of a primordial light, 
that God so ordained the nations to have a specific vocation in salvation history and this is expressed in their national temperament, in their national personality, their national spirit. And this is what he said about England. He said, quote, with the English we find something similar to what happened with the Prussian people. Both peoples were so deeply changed by heresy that it becomes difficult to reconstitute what they would have been had they been faithful. What is the bad side of England? England is, has a commercial, masonic, cold and frustrated spirit. There is much emptiness and frustration in the English spirit. With Anglicanism, the magnificent cathedrals of old became, become emptied of life and grace. They are doubtless still very distinguished, but they lack life. They are elevated, but they are as dry as an umbrella stick. Most of the simple churches in Rome have more life than the magnificent Westminster Abbey. If you look at a picture of Churchill or Edward VIII when they were young, you still see in them a springtime spirit. When you compare these pictures with the old Churchill or the Edward VIII married with Wallace Simpson, there is an immense change. Both men are so saturated with the Masonic spirit that all the promises of youth were raised to the ground. What is the English vocation? I would say that England was called to realise something of an angelic innocence. In the English soul there is something so honest and serene that it obliged Protestantism to assume a Catholic overgarment Anglicanism, otherwise it would not have been swallowed by the people. Something that still reflects the good side of the English soul is the English landscapes. In them it is rare to find an astonishingly beautiful panorama, but all of the English landscapes are filled with charming little gardens and corner spots that are called to be appreciated separately. In those ambiences there is such freshness and such richness that only very innocent souls Almost angelic souls know how to admire them properly. Here is a bridge with a cluster of ducks swimming under it. Over there is a mossy stone in the water with small blue flowers. Further down the way an ivy climbing a wall is worthy of a painting. Or perhaps a tragic wind blows away the fog to reveal the tower of a castle. It is through flashes like these that we, reconstitute, we can reconstitute the innocence and purity that the English are called to have when they are faithful. This angelic innocence certainly was the substance of the early medieval English spirit, which gave many saints to the church. End quote. Well, first of all, that was glorious prose and, um, and you know, almost entirely something which I can agree, agree wholeheartedly. I would make one distinguo that I think there's a very crucial difference between England and Prussia. Uh, that, as, as we've been discussing in this hour, England uh, was profoundly Catholic for 1500 years. It's arguable that Prussia never became fully Catholic, uh, which means it was, it was easy prey for the Reformation when it came along, uh, because the roots weren't deep. So I, I, I would say that for, for me, England understood in its fullness is Catholic. Uh, and that would explain largely what, what, what that quote was about, is the manifestation of what it is to be English in the truest, fullest, deepest sense of the word, is a manifestation of Merry England. Um, and we see, if you like, that drawn out beautifully in Tolkien's mythology for England. Because Tolkien actually says that, that in the Lord of the Rings and his wider legendarium, he was trying to create a mythology for my country, for England. And the Shire, which is universally admired in the same way as a non-Englishman such as Dolivera there, can, um, can um, uh, talk about the beauty of the English landscape uh, and the way it's, it's loved by the people. The English landscape is beautiful because it's loved by the people. There's a, there's a soil, soul, nexus. And that's true everywhere. Uh, and you, you, you really discover something of the beauty of a people by the beauty of its land, beauty of, its, uh, of how, how it lives with its landscape. And so we see, if you like, that England could be seen as a, a, a land of hobbits by the fact that the English landscape, if you leave out the various Mordors, in other words, the cities that, that um, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, that, that are spattered across the, uh, the, the beauty, Shocking if you leave those enough. aside and just keep yourself in the countryside, the small villages and the small market towns, you are living in the Shire. So that, that, that um, Tolkien brings something very profound and true to life in his manifestation of what is substantially, philosophically speaking, essentially English in his characterization 
of the Shire. So that's the whole point. The whole connection between soil and soul, because uh, you know we are built for home, we are designed for home. Home is heaven. This is a valley of tears. It is a land of exile. But insofar as we have a sense of home, insofar as we're not uh, cosmopolitan, rootless, uh, we are showing ourselves as wanting and desiring heaven. And so the, the whole connection between soil and soul is essential, which is why in my poem, I talk about the, the Yorkshire Moors and the Yorkshire Dales being much more glorious than any political manifestation of power, empire or otherwise. And we, we mentioned, you mentioned the apparition of Our Lady of Walsingham, England being a land of the Annunciation and this procession from the spiritual to the material. The Catechism states that Our Lady was invited to conceive, so her ascent or consent predated the Annunciation. She had the liberty to choose. And the horrific uh, heresy of liberalism that we're living under originates in England, you know, we have to admit, uh, with uh, the proto-Enlightenment figures of, you know, Hobbes and Locke. And then going further back, you know, we've, this, this island has produced great saints, but also great heresy arcs, William of Ockham, uh, Pelagius and liberalism is basically repackaged Pelagianism. So, so the devil, I think, saw this uh, beautiful vocation of of true liberty and twisted it and marred it because he always distorts and 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 mars what is beautiful and of God. Do you, do you see something sort of mystical there? Yes, I basically agree with it, everything you've said there. Uh, but it is a reminder that no nation, no people are perfect, right? We are, we are, first of all, none of us as individuals are, are perfect. Alexander Solzhenitsyn says that the battle between good and evil passes through each individual heart. So we should not ever try to whitewash our nation as being something perfect, which would be a lie. It'd be something akin to what the Nazis tried to do with Germany. Uh, but neither should we become ethnomasochistic and, and point, point to examples of, of bad things done by, by people of our nation as somehow besmirching everything about the nation itself. We need to distinguish about that which is good and true and beautiful about what it is to be English from those that betray that vision of goodness, truth and beauty. And that's true of, uh, of all peoples. It's true of us. Right? Most of the time, please God, we're true to all that's good, true and beautiful. Occasionally we are not. Uh, and, 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 and as long as we know that we're not and, and, and go on our knees to, to confession and then get back on the right side in the, in the eternal struggle, then that's what it's about. And we should expect every nation, if you like, to be um, uh, a broader personification of what happens to each person. Amen. I think that is a, a lovely note to... To end on, unless there were any uh, parting thoughts that you would like to leave the listeners with? No, except to say that, uh, that this has been uh, a joy and a privilege for me because, um, you know, I do quite a lot of interviews and uh, it's rare that I get chance to delve and dive as deeply and profoundly and mystically and also in, in the, just the, 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 the facts of history as, as you've enabled me to do. And it's largely, by the way, due to, the, to your own eloquence. So, you know, that an interview is only going to be as good as, as, as the questions are asked and discussion that's a consequence of that. And this has been a great discussion because you've contributed a great deal to it. So I, I feel honoured and privileged to be, to be a guest. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Pierce. I have only got through a little bit of my notes uh, uh, that bespeaks your own er erudition and eloquence there so you know perhaps we can we can uh, explore more about england's catholic past in the future would be delighted thank you very much